dropped in uh, anticipation. We are, it might be a minute early, but we will we'll begin. Welcome, Susan Andrews. I'm very pleased that you can join us for this very important event. A couple of housekeeping things before we begin. Um, you can see where, if we need to leave the building quickly, there's a door over here, and another, another door where you can begin. Um, at the back of the church, um, downstairs, uh, if you turn left, and you get to the bottom of the stairs, um, our toilets, if you should, should need one. Um, could you make sure that your mobile phone's not going to be As we uh, come towards the end of this particular um, political campaign, I am very mindful of the fact that around the world there are hundreds of millions of people who do not have the democratic privilege that we do. There are thousands of political prisoners who languish um, in prison, whose families are away from them um, because they have protested about things like that. We live in a very privileged society. I wonder, before we begin, if you might just join me in a few moments of silence as we think of those people in countries far away um, who put up with those regimes. Will we give you a moment of silence? Thank you very much, Casper, and uh, a very warm welcome to you all. We meet this evening here in St Andrew's Church for Truth by kind invitation, arrangement, and I'm going to stitch him up now, suggestion uh, of the Rector of Adruth, uh, the Reverend Casper Bush, who approached me with this idea um, a little while ago. Our Redruth, of course, a town with its own long history and heritage, recognised by UNESCO, uh, a heritage of international importance, a town with a substantially growing population surrounded by an ever-widening belt of high-tech industries, and a town which retains, I am very pleased to say, a very strong community spirit. Uh, however, in common with many other communities in Cornwall, a town not without its challenges. A, particularly, a particular welcome this evening to the Mayor of Redruth, who joins us, Councillor Henry Biscoe, uh, his wife, the Mayoral Consort, Councillor Alison Biscoe, the Deputy Mayor, Councillor uh, Deborah Reeve, and the President of the Redruth District Chamber of Commerce, uh, Mr Manny Hernandez. To um, many councillors from both the Town and Cornwall Unitary uh, Council, as well as members of the uh, groundbreaking Redruth Youth Council. But most of all, to you, the electorate. Our four candidates standing in this constituency are seated in surname alphabetical order. And before I invite them to um, make a short opening uh, comment, which I'm going to ask them uh, to keep to just about a minute, and I can be as harsh as the Speaker of the House of Commons, um, are uh, George Eustace on the right from the Conservative Party, uh, Jeff Garbett immediately to my right from the Green Party, um, Jeff Williams to my left from the Liberal Democrat Party, and Graham Winter um, to my far left from the Labour Party. A wit called this meeting our very own G4 gathering, because uh, <laughs> of course we have uh, George, Jeff, Jeff, and Graham. Uh, without uh, further ado, um, and to keep things um, balanced, I thought I would start by inviting uh, Graham uh, Winter 
from the Labour Party just to say a few words, uh, no longer than a minute, please, um, about yourself and uh, why you're standing. Right, uh, a minute. Okay. Uh, my name is Graham Winter, standing for the Labour Party. I've uh, got involved in uh, left wing politics, I guess, when I was a teenager, interested in animal rights. CND, all that kind of stuff, the Greenpeace that was going on back in the late 70s and 80s. Uh, otherwise, I've worked in IT, a career in the IT industry, I retrained as a mature student, did a degree in environmental management, and I've worked for the Environment Agency uh, as an environment regulator for the last 19 years. Uh, the skills I can bring, hopefully, uh, from that job are I'm liaising with industry, I work with the construction sector in particular, advising them warning them of new regulations, working together how we can work pragmatically to make the regulations work for industry. Uh, on a personal level, I've lived in Campbell for 12 years. Uh, my family and my children have both gone to school all the way through there. Uh, my son's currently doing his GC, in the middle of his GCSEs. Uh, and for me, in, in, at the end of the next parliament, he'll be just leaving university, I hope, should he be successful in getting in, but he'll be leaving with 40 to 50,000 pound debt, so I want to try and do something about that. Thank you very much, Graham Winter. Um, our next uh, candidate, uh, Jeff Williams. Hi, yeah, my name is Jeff Williams, and I'm a Lib Dem candidate. Um, I uh, worked professionally as a teacher and lecturer in both secondary and uh, further in higher education and uh, unfortunately had to give up on medical grounds back in the 90s. I got involved in um, politics when Mrs Thatcher got elected because I, in my relatively youthful arrogance, was determined to do something about it. Uh, and I served as 30 year, for 30 years as a, a councillor up country, stood for uh, parliament several times. We've been down in um, Red Roof now, um, Ilogan, in fact, for a couple of years. And uh, why I'm standing in this election is basically because I believe very strongly in the values that the Liberal Democrats themselves stand for. I'm fired up by Brexit and I hope that I can bring the skills and knowledge and experience that I gained over the last 30, 40 years to serve the people of Red Roof and Campbell and Pale. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff Williams. Um, George Eustace, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, I grew up uh, in Cornwall and actually spent uh, 10 years working in the family business, which is Travascus Farm down at uh, Connor Downs, but I got very interested in politics over the Euro debate uh, initially, and in 1999 I joined that campaign and then did a number of other jobs in politics, including being Press Secretary David Cameron for a while. But by uh, my late 20s, early 30s, I was thinking I wanted to stand myself in politics. So in 2010, I stood uh, for election here as a Conservative, and I've been the MP uh, for the last seven years. And in my time here locally, I really tried to focus on regeneration of the area. I got very involved, for instance, uh, here in Red Ruth, uh, getting the Cornwall Archive Centre located on the old derelict site of the brewery, which I think would be a real um, catalyst for change. And I'm putting myself up again because I want to build on what I've started, and also because I'm somebody who campaigned to leave the European Union, and I think the decision was right for our country. Uh, but we need to uh, get the negotiation right now, put the arguments of last year behind us, and all work together on a new type of partnership with Europe, and I want to be involved in that debate. Thank you very much, George Eustace. And uh, Jeff Garbutt, please. Hi, um, I'm Jeff Garbutt. I've lived in Carharrock. I think we, I moved there 30 years ago, so I've been here for quite a long time. My son went to Redwood School, and uh, I joined the Green Party way back actually in 1976 when I lived in Taunton. And the reason I joined is because an extraordinary world tour I did as a young man aged between 20 and 24, spending about two years in developed countries, a long time in America, and then another two years in underdeveloped countries, including a year wandering around the Pacific Islands. And the contrast between these two ways of life was so enormous. And I knew that everybody aspires for the way of life that America had with massive energy consumption, enormous 
consumption of materials and, and, and all that goes with that. And I thought, this is impossible. You know, the world is going to go over a cliff. And I found that the Ecology Party uh, was catered for this particular position that I, that I stood in. So it was exactly right for me. And I, and I would say that the Ecology Party, is, uh, Green Party as it is now, um, has a unique and very, very important role to play in, in British politics, even though we tend to hang around at the bottom of the, of the lists. Although I did save my deposit when I stood in 2015, so that was a re reasonable vote, nearly 3,000. I hope we can do that again, because I do think what we're saying is important. The environment is our ultimate political reality, and we need to think about that much more than we are at the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff Garbutt. Um, I have a written question here, um, which I thought it would be a, a good idea to put to uh, the candidates before we throw open uh, the hustings. Um, the, um, uh, Reverend Bush has got um, a, a roving mic, so um, if you want to ask a question, I will indicate you and the mic will come to you um, uh, in order to ask your question. But here is an opener for 10 which was um, put forward by one of the attendees tonight. And uh, I'll read the question and then we'll, we'll start, uh, start the answers. What do you propose, or I guess that would be, what would you be doing about adult mental health services, in particular in West Cornwall? Currently the situation is that there are insufficient inpatient beds and vulnerable adults are sent out of Cornwall. George Eustace, please. Well, I think this is a really important area because uh, mental health uh, issues have grown uh, quite a lot over the last 20 years. <clears throat> As we've understood mental health more, uh, there's been more uh, diagnoses in this area, and I think in particular um, there are issues around uh, mental health with young people, and particularly uh, teenagers are seeing a growing problem there. Um, I, I, I've, basically um, campaigned along with all the other MPs uh, for a number of years, uh, alongside groups like the Invictus Trust, which was uh, actually set up uh, by somebody whose uh, who's son sadly uh, committed suicide, to, to really press the case uh, for a uh, designated ward, particularly for uh, teenagers in Cornwall. And I'm pleased that they, that they have now um, secured that. And there is going to be a new facility built at Bodmin uh, so that we don't have to send people out of county. We all recognise that we can get this challenge in Cornwall, that we're at the end of the line, we're um, a peripheral area, it's difficult to pull in support from other areas because we're surrounded by the sea. In other parts of the country it's less of an issue to send someone out of county, it's a big issue in Cornwall. And I think that that new that unit that's being built in Bodmin is a really important step forward. Thank you very much, Sir. George. Sir. Jeff Williams. Yeah, thank you. Some 20 years ago I started work as what is called an Associate Mental Health Act manager. Uh, a, a job, a, a voluntary job, which entails um, speaking with clients, um, patients, and those who generally have been uh, put on a mental health uh, section under the Mental Health Act. And one of the greatest improvements that could be made to any mental health service anywhere in the country is to make far more accessible the assessment centres that some uh, trusts are able to provide where people can go, can drop in when they feel either ill or uncertain as to what's happening to them um, and be assured of care and at least an initial diagnosis. That's the sort of thing that I'd like to see extended not only through Cornwall but in fact through the rest of the country. There is enormous pressure on mental health beds um, and part of the way of addressing that has been for example through uh, the introduction of community treatment orders for um, the more seriously ill. Um, apart from that though what we must strive for within the NHS is to ensure that mental health patients, those suffering from uh, any form of mental illness, receive the same parity 
as patients with physical ailments in terms of waiting time and um, accessibility treatment. Um, of particular concern has to be the uh, access that young people have to uh, mental health services. Um, it is a, a complete scandal that young people are so often sent out of county for treatment because there is no bed available for them. Now we as a party are planning to address problems within the NHS uh, by fiscal means. In other words, we want to be straight with people and say we are going to have to provide a lot more through the NHS, including mental, mental health services, and we're going to ask people to dig a little bit deeper in their pockets. And we're proposing a one penny in the pound increase on income tax, which would be dedicated, hypothecated, to use the technical term, towards the NHS, including mental health services. Now that's one way that I think we can distribute the load and ensure that we get the funding necessary to improve not only mental health services, but the NHS in general. Alongside other measures, which we haven't even asked about the question specifically about mental health, so, so no doubt we'll Thank come you. back on to the NHS. Later. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Garbett, please. Right, so I must admit that in my brief one minute bio, I forgot to mention my job. Um, the time that I've been here, the 30 years I've been in Cornwall, uh, most of that time I was working as a science lecturer at Cornwall College, and also I work and still work for the Open University. Now the facts, that becomes important here because many of the students that I dealt with were suffering from various mental health problems. So I've seen firsthand how intelligent, thoughtful people can just lose the ability to make the best of themselves just through various mental ailments which quite often they don't necessarily get the treatment for that they need. As everyone else has been saying, I think mental health should get the same kind of financial backing as, as we get from any other form of ill health and in particular there should be um, available therapies within 28 days of referral and sometimes it's a bit longer than that. And once uh, the patient um, therapist uh, in relationship is established then it should be available 24-7, 24, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week because crises can happen at all sorts of times and, and unfortunately quite often they can lead to tragedy. So the money has to be put into this um, in order to provide the sort of care that's needed. The, the pressures on young people now are intense, especially with all this social media. And, uh, and really, I think it's fair to say that we're having a bit of a mental health crisis, especially amongst the young. One of the interesting, I've just got my um, manifesto open here, an interesting thing here is, is to eliminate the use of police cells as places of safety for children, which uh, I must admit, I didn't realise this happens, but, but apparently even with very young people, if they're potentially damaging to themselves or other people, sticking them in a police cell is not the best way to, 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 to get them out of that situation. Um, also, in my uh, manifesto here, there's a mention of paying special attention to, to mothers during, during and after pregnancy, Children and adolescents, of course, black minority ethnic people, refugees, um, ex-service people, obviously, some of the worst cases of mental um, uh, difficulties that I, that I found amongst my students was those returning from Iraq and these kind of places. So they all have to be looked after. Thank you very much. And uh, finally on this round, uh, not uh, last but not least, of course, Graham Winter. I'll uh, try to keep it perhaps a bit brief, huh? uh, but we do, we all recognise the problems with uh, mental health care and it's something that has come up quite a lot on the doorsteps uh, in this area in particular. Uh, mental health care uh, is often linked to social deprivation as well, so uh, we understand that we do have problems here. Uh, pleased to see that you know, people like Coastline are working on new facilities in the area which will really help. Uh, but fundamentally, the, the health social care system is, is, is broken at the moment. It's not integrated properly with uh, the National Health Service, and that's where we're getting uh, everybody that, that's missing out. 
uh, because we don't have a joined up service. Uh, I was pleased to hear George say that they, they, they try to put the case forward that the call will be any different, and, and it is very different. We need different solutions down here, and, and it's taken a long time for that message to get through. And, uh, and that's part of my key message is, is for what I'll be doing is trying to get that message through because not just in this area, other areas too need a different solution to the one offered to the whole country. Uh, Labour, Labour is, is committed to uh, ending out of county treatment, uh, so that, that's, a, that's a red line. Uh, but also we'll be providing some proper funding for NHS and social care. And what Labour wants, Labour's approach to it is, is to uh, get, get the local providers all together, and that's what seems to be missing. There seems to be a few cogs missing between the NHS and social care and mental health care, uh, so they don't link. Uh, so Labour's approach to things, and, and it's, it's their approach to most things, is to start bottom up, start with the people, start with the needs, see what the needs are in the area, and design services around the needs. Now, I know people will come back and say, well, they'll just ask for lots, lots more money than you can afford. But, but, that, but that, that at least is the starting point. It isn't, you know, the, the, the money won't fund absolutely everything. But the starting point has to be based around the needs of local people. And the needs of the people in Cornwall are different. Our, our demographic, our ageing population is, is perhaps 20 years ahead of some parts of the country when we're dealing with the much older. So we have to deal with uh, dementia and things like that. Uh, so, you know, we, we really have to do things differently here, and we need to take that on board. It, at an early stage, one of the like, interesting things is in the, the manifesto under education, but uh, I, I always mention it if this question comes up, is the fact that Labour will make sure that every school has uh, a counsellor available, and that every, every child has access to counselling services. Uh, so this will help in prevention and early identification of any issues and stresses around around because young people are suffering an awful lot with mental health care uh, uh, as we know the way the education system is at the moment puts an awful lot of pressure on them so that's another commitment that Labour will put in place for our young people. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, your questions please if you would uh, raise your hands. The first one, uh, the lady with her hand held particularly high, I think a green pen. Uh, the mic is just on its way to you. Thank you. So my hand up went up very quickly it's because my question sort of follows on when you've grown up from this one. Um, it's a question to all um, If you're elected as MP next week, you'll be the voice in Westminster of us, the people of Red Roof, of Campbell, of Hale and the surrounding areas. You'll be our voice. What are the three most important things you want Westminster to hear about the needs of this constituency? Well, I think that's an excellent question. Uh, the three most important things uh, that you would wish Westminster to hear from this constituency. Jeff Garber. Hmm. I, I thought you might choose me first because I haven't had very long to think up <laughs> but the you most might. important three. <laughs> but uh, but um, let's have a think now. Well, whenever I think of Cornwall, and this area in particular, I think of the uh, enormous opportunities available for ex by expanding uh, our renewable energy um, potential that we have here, which is enormous. And uh, I know that when subsidies are removed from uh, um, the, uh, the, the solar production, solar industry, an awful lot of people around here lost their jobs, people who have been putting things on my roof only a couple of years ago. So I would certainly be pushing for um, a regulation with this removal of some of, the, uh, some of the restrictions that have been placed on uh, wind turbines, certainly community owned wind turbines, and the setting up of, of, uh, of solar systems on roofs and so on. So that would be the first thing, but that's because I'm a green, green candidate, that's the first thing that comes into my head. There are obviously a lot of other important things going on here. Um, one of the key Green Party policies, which people sometimes mock, but they shouldn't because it's happening, uh, for example, in Finland, is something called the, um, uh, the universal, um, universal Basic Income, UBI, which means that everybody, regardless of whether they're working or not, would receive a basic income 
um, in addition to any housing benefits that they might receive. And it goes up a bit when you, when you get older and it's down a little bit when you're a child. But if there's money going to people, it doesn't go away if you get a job, so it avoids the poverty trap and it ensures that nobody should ever go hungry. Everyone should have enough money to be able to um, feed themselves and feed their families, even if it's only at that basic level. Now, the advantage of this system, first of all, it doesn't require massive bureaucracy. It doesn't mean that people will suddenly find they've been dropped off benefits and have to go to food banks. Uh, it means, and, uh, and it's obviously much, much simpler to administer. What about the people who earn lots of money when they get this? Well, they, um, they're going to make up for that by increasing their taxes. So this is the sort of thing, I mean, as a Green Party candidate, I'm not necessarily expecting to become the next MP. So these are aspirations rather than things that I'd be able to put into place. I think if I was to say, I'm going to do this, you might think I'm being a bit presumptuous. But um, certainly that's the aspirations that I would have had. That's, that's two, I've only done that's two. That's two, absolutely. Yeah, and have I got time for the brief, three? Brief, brief, brief. <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> yeah, yeah. Which will be a third one. Looking after our beaches, one of the things that's keeping Cornwall beautiful is the regulations that come with our membership of the EU. Now, we don't quite know what's going to happen to these. We, perhaps they'll stay in place till 2020, who knows? But we must ensure that they remain as strong now. That's the regulation uh, which affects farmers through the CAP and our, beach, our beaches and, and the uh, cleanliness of our sea waters. These things must be kept in place, if not enhanced. So I'd certainly fight for all these environmental controls that come with our EU membership. Thank you. Um, Graham Winter. Uh, right, thank you. Uh, my first priority, I, I think, would be around young people. Uh, we've got, so we, I'm sure George will mention the uh, link road, etc., that's been done recently with EU money. But clearly, there's many plots waiting to be filled with industry and getting the economy going. So we really need to push for jobs. Uh, along with jobs, obviously, we need wages. We need wages to match the, the rest of the country if we can. We can hope. Uh, but Labour will introduce a national minimum wage of £10 by 2020, so we want to push that up, we want to make a fair wage, it has to pay to go to work. Uh, it, along with jobs, uh, Labour will be introducing a, a national investment bank, so investing £25 billion a year for 10 years, a programme of investment, uh, and there'll be regional versions of that, so it will affect, there will be things in this area. Uh, and, and I personally don't believe the South West starts at Bristol, I think it starts at Tamar actually. Uh, so uh, I, I will be pushing to make sure that we get a share of that. But, but you know, I might be elected and Labour might not, so I can't talk about all just Labour policies. You know, those are the things I will be fighting for, fighting for jobs and wages uh, for young people. Uh, that's about their opportunities. People tell me they can't come back from university because they're in debt so they can't afford to come back because of low wages and low opportunities. I want to do something about that. So, and I think that just leaves you the third oh, thing. No, that's, that's, that's young people, that was just one. Oh, right. The second was housing and infrastructure, but housing we need to get right. We need more affordable <coughs> housing here. Uh, and and Labour sets some minimum standards. Actually, it's a minimum standard that every house must be habitable. Uh, how is that not already the law? Uh, so uh, we're going to build. We're, we're going to build more housing, and I know people here will be concerned about that. Actually, a lot of the housing we need in Cornwall is already allocated. It's just not being built, and it's not being built uh, in an affordable way. It's not being built for people to rent. So that's what we need to do. And the infrastructure needs to go with housing because it needs to protect our environment because we because all the water and sewage needs treatment, and again, this is where Cornwall needs a special case. We need more sewage treatment works just because of our geography. It's not down to us to pay for it all. Uh, so that's two. And third, we've already touched on it, has to be around the NHS uh, funding. It has to be funded properly. We have to have a local solution and local funding for it. Uh, this week, uh, Kerno, National, Kerno Commissioning Trust, Clinical Commissioning Trust, uh, should have released their budget. They refused to release their figures, uh, but we estimate they're seven, 70 billion in debt. Uh, and they are not called Royal Cornwall Trust in a similar position of 70 billion pounds of debt. We can't go on. They're at breaking point. To resolve to resolve that debt, 
so, uh, I'm not, hope they're not going to do this, but if they closed all the cottage hospitals in Cornwall, that would save them 32 million. Okay? They got 70, 70 million in debt, approximately. Right. So those are the three I'd sort Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Uh, George Eustis, please, sir. Well, firstly, I want to build on what I've already said, which is economic regeneration, I think, for this part of Cornwall is absolutely crucial. I think we've made some progress, we've seen some derelict urban sites uh, regenerated, brought back into use for the community, and we are now starting to see computer software companies, uh, renewable energy companies, and digital uh, companies starting to locate in Cornwall, because the advent of superfast broadband means that our geographic distance is less of a problem. But there's more to do, and uh, it's certainly the case um, that Cornwall is not just part of the South West. We are distinct, we've got our own culture and our own identity, and I've always argued that needs to be recognised and should continue to be, and we've got different economic needs as well. And in our manifesto, um, we've announced there's going to be something called the UK Prosperity Fund uh, to replace the EU funding, and that is going to target uh, grant support to those areas that have fallen behind, and I'll be arguing the case of Cornwall. Uh, secondly, I think there's further to go in terms of getting fair funding on certain public services in Cornwall. Uh, notably, I think on the NHS, the last review um, that was done by the uh, National uh, Institute of Clinical Excellence who reviewed uh, these things, I think they didn't put sufficient weighting, in my view, on the age of the population. They looked at all sorts of other deprivation uh, measures, but the truth is uh, you need healthcare most. Uh, when you uh, are elderly, when you're later in life, that's when you need uh, that support and I think it's not recognised sufficiently uh, at the moment. Um, finally, I, I do think there's a real issue around development. We do need <coughs> new housing, but I've always been really clear that we have to um, focus on brownfield sites before greenfield sites. And I think although there's a lot of national pressure for new housing, people have got to recognise that here in Cornwall it's a very narrow uh, peninsula uh, there's a bike shop down the road near Portreath that sells a t-shirt saying, I cycled across England. Uh, and of course, the, the mineral uh, tramway uh, footpath runs from Portreath down to Beverley. It's only about eight or nine miles to go from the Atlantic uh, down to the Channel. And uh, if you have insensitive development, it really does start to mar uh, our landscape, beautiful landscape here in Cornwall. So I think the fact that we are uh, quite a narrow peninsula means we have to be extra careful when it comes to what we build and where we build it. Thank you very much, George Eustis. And uh, finally, this conjectural uh, wish list of the three messages to Westminster, Jeff Williams. Thank you. The most pressing issue facing all the communities in Cornwall is education funding. Because decisions are going to have to be made on that. <laughs> decisions are going to have to be made on that as early as this September. It's a scandal, a total scandal, that the schools in this constituency, right the way through from Red Roof to Hale, are suffering, or will be suffering, from up to £7 million pounds worth of cuts. Just a, it's a disgrace that teach, the head teachers are having to essentially sack members of staff. Um, now, the government says that it has pumped money into the education system, and it has but that money has not kept step with rising school numbers and the other demands on teaching staff, the curriculum, and so on and so forth. Now, we're proposing a, 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 across the country a seven uh, billion investment in education, which we hope will go some way to address some of these problems. The second most pressing issue, uh, I think, is um, the NHS. Um, and again, I already mentioned, so I shan't repeat it, the, the one pound income tax applies, <coughs> um, which we are confident will help go to redressing, ad addressing many of the problems and the issue of, so, of care and inter integration of care and, and health services. We're also planning in the NHS to reintroduce nursing bursaries. Um, and thirdly, uh, the issue facing a, a number of our communities, as has been touched on by others, is housing. And particularly housing for younger people, whether they are young couples wanting to buy or young, per, young individuals setting off on their own uh, with a partner, uh, perhaps seeking to rent. The odds are against them 
at every turn and we are proposing means uh, to help youngsters not only onto the housing purchase ladder but onto the housing rental ladder as well um, by um, uh, giving uh, loans essentially um, which will help to, either towards purchase or towards the rental. Um, there is great deal around that, but I don't want to take up too much. Thank you very much. Those are my three. Those are your three. The next question, please. Um, the first was the gentleman with the beard. Um, just thank you. Yes, sir. and then like the lady over there, I started to hand up because this is determined to what's just been talked about. Um, George Eustace has just been saying that health and social care needs more money here in Cornwall. Um, as I understand it, health and social care devolved to Cornwall Council, and George Eustace has consistently voted on his voting record to reduce money to local government. Now, during the Brexit debate, we were told it's our money. Well, I believe our taxes are our money that he's keeping away from here. Um, so do we trust his five words that he's just given us, or do we trust his voting record? Well, there we go, I'm right. Thank you. I, um, I think it only fair to invite uh, George Eustace to answer that one, but sure. first of all, if you... I'm happy to do so. Uh, look, uh, across government departments, uh, people have had to make savings. But there's still a real issue around the priorities that Cornwall Council has. And, and let me uh, explain this. Two years ago, we had something called the devolution deal. And the plan was uh, the plan was that we would... Oh, you're going to let me... Please, please, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not quite sure what's about that, but anyway. Please. The, the idea was, the central part of that was to join up NHS spending with adult social care spending. Everybody had entered that in good faith. Since then, uh, the government's done two things. They've allowed uh, local authorities, including Cornwall Council, which they've taken, to increase uh, their precept by 2%, uh, provided that money was ring-fenced for social care. And they've also put additional money in, several billion pounds nationally, a chunk of that's gone to Cornwall Council to help with adult social care. When I talk to the NHS managers, they say, you know what, all Cornwall Council has done is cut the budget in other areas so that their total spend on adult social care has actually gone down, despite the fact that they've got the precept and they've got the extra money. And that there's a real issue here with Cornwall Council. They find half a million pounds to try and do a bit to make sure of the city of culture, and yet they are actually cutting the adult social care budget, even though they've been given ring-fenced money to spend on that. And they're doing that because they're actually planning Please. to basically put the responsibility on the NHS uh, while not handing over the budget. They're running the budget down. I think that's a wrong way to behave. And actually, they need pulling up. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Corbyn Council, of course, uh, dominated this past few years by uh, the Liberal Democrats and um, the, uh, the Independents, I believe. Um, so perhaps a, a brief comment from Jeff Williams on this. Yeah. I'm not quite clear what the question is, actually, because uh, <laughs> I think, thought it was about um, George's voting record. The question was actually about adult social care um, and um, uh, the funding of it. Yep. Um, of course, that's a devolved issue, if we can call it as such. Yep, 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 yep. Well, I, I'm not a Cornwall councillor, so I'm not going to answer for them. But what I have done already is say what we would tend to do when we're in government, mm. and that is try and integrate social care and the NHS, because the two are inseparable. And we are so many decades behind some of our European um, counterparts who have seen this and acted upon it and managed to get, get themselves systems where, where the two services are fully integrated. Mm. Um, Graham, what's your comments from you on? I'm sorry, that was not my question. My question was... Um, should we trust the words of George Eustace, who say we need more money, who, out of the other hand, has taken more money away from Cornwall? Regardless of what they've done with it, he has consistently voted to remove money from local government. So my question is, what do we trust? His words or his deeds? Right. Well... Can I just say, I think I have answered that, and I've said there's been an additional precept going to Cornwall Council and additional ring-fence money for social care. 
fact, what they've done is done a smoke and mirror job to remove money net from the adult social care budget, despite the fact they've been given additional funds. Thank you. Um, um, briefly, 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 uh, comments, Graham Minton? The question is about George's voting records. I'll let you judge that next week. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm just... For absolute balance, which I guaranteed everybody, uh, Jeff Garber, any comment? Well, this is all part of uh, the Conservative Party's austerity programme, isn't it? Take, because we're taking money away from things like, well, the council are, uh, are having to knock a few 50 million or something. I never get very good with figures, but they are having to knock quite a few million off their, off their budget. They've got to cut back money left, right and centre. And, you know, where, where, where's all the money gone, that's what I would say, because we're supposed to be a very wealthy country. This austerity is just taking away from the people who can least afford it and who can least cope with it. Um, thank you. Uh, got some, a question from the corner, which I promised, and then the gentleman back there. So um, if, if we could just... Thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's a bit of an to ask supplementary I know, but time, 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 you know. <laughs> Don't interrupt. <laughs> and, uh, I think I might supplementary to uh, our Conservative candidate is he mentioned the UK Prosperity Fund just now. I won't know, is that Boris's bus money that he promised on the end of the coach that he said he was going to give to the NHS? But we never saw that either. <laughs> but my question on a different subject is St. West Water. Uh, they've been in court more than the cranes. And what would the panel do to help its customers get a fair deal? Because at budget, whatever happens, they still take our money and take uh, their dividends, and we've got to pay, and we have no option but to keep paying. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that question. I think it's pretty well known that we, uh, we pay quite a lot for our water here. I'm going to throw this open uh, firstly to Jeff Winter, please. Um, the question is, what are you going to do to help us with our excessive water bills, I believe, isn't it? Whichever way you wish to uh, try and alleviate the bills by either uh, putting a limit on them or nationalising them again. Right. Pretty straightforward then. Do we, do we nationalise the water, water boards again and help with our bills, please? To me? Absolutely. Right. Uh, well, with, with, with uh, some of the utilities, you have a choice. You can choose a different company if you don't like them, if you don't like what they're doing, or if somebody's more competitive. We, we don't have a choice with water. They provide a service, a service that every one of us needs and uses. So a service should be provided by the government. Uh, I, we, would, we would propose to, to attempt to, to nationalise the water companies. They're there to provide a service for us, not to provide profits for companies and services. Um, I broadly go along with what Graham said, particularly as far as water is concerned. There are certain industries that I don't think it would benefit to bring under a central control, but water is certainly one of them. Um, I don't agree that it would necessarily work for uh, other utilities because there is sufficient competition there for electricity and so on if one is inclined to compare. Thank you. Compared. Um, but as far as water is concerned, um, no, it is, a, it, it's a, it's a, it is a, an essential, isn't it? It's a human life essential. We can all live without mobile phones, yeah. but we can't live without water. Um, Jeff Garber. Uh, well, this is an interesting one. Um, I, many of you will receive my little leaflet with a picture of me with the seagulls around me head on. And uh, that had a telephone number on, and I received a call, I think it was today, this morning, from someone very irate about her water. She's had it tested, and she said it had uh, levels of glyphosate, which apparently uh, are okay for the EU, but much more than was present in water in Wales. So it seems to me that, that not having a central control over water means that different water companies can have their, almost their own um, policies towards things like water purification and the levels of, of, of uh, pollutants in the water which are acceptable. So 
certainly the Green Party would, along with the railways, um, would renationalise uh, water companies. As um, Graham said, to a big clap, I think, you know, this shouldn't be an area for profit, this should be an area for as a public service. Thank you. And um, finally, George Eustace. Well, there was a long standing problem that bills uh, here in the southwest and southwest water were higher because of some really big infrastructure work that they had to do uh, to tackle the problem of sewage in our waters. The truth is this the last Labour government in the 13 years they were there didn't do anything about that. Um, in 2012, uh, a number of us pushed our government very hard, and we've since then had a rebate that goes to every household at £50 per year off their bill. Uh, and that has been uh, an important step forward. It's £40 million a year pumped into uh, Devon and Cornwall. The, I think long term, there are other things that uh, we need to be looking at. Uh, the evidence is really clear that those who go on a water meter uh, tend to have much lower uh, water bills than those on rates. And one of the, one of the, big, okay, one of the big problems... Okay, please, yeah, please. Um, one of the um, big problems that you often get, though, is that sometimes uh, the most vulnerable people are in rented accommodation, uh, don't have the authority to switch to a meter and their landlords are reluctant to. And I think we need to make it much easier for those remaining people to get onto meters because they do tend to have much lower bills. So it's quite a stark difference. The other thing that I've uh, argued for is a uh, what I call a national social tariff so that the actual burden of helping people who are really struggling to afford their water bills is spread across all the water companies nationally. That's what I was pushing for in 2012. In the uh, event, uh, people said that was quite complicated, so they went for the rebate instead. But I still think that a sustainable long-term approach is to have some kind of nationally funded uh, social tax. Thank you. Um, gentlemen up here. The um, striped shirt on. Thank you. Just, just rewinding a little bit, uh, you said about Cornwall Council wasting money as a finance. Obviously, most of us here are council taxpayers. I've got, do you think it's right that Cornwall Council is wasting money, a lot of money, on this culture bid? Now, this money that they're wasting on this culture bid could be going to much better things. Thank you. Um, this is a question about the culture bid, which uh, I understand is being put to bed anyway now, um, unless I'm much mistaken. Um, but um, a brief comment, perhaps, from our candidates. Um, uh, Jeff? Garbutt, I should yep, say. That's all right. <laughs> on this side. Um, personally, I, I'm a great believer in the, in the ability of cultural events to raise people's morale, to make life worth it. I think this idea that money always has to be spent on sort of nuts and bolts is not such a good thing because if we have a very healthy, well-housed uh, population, what are they going to enjoy, you know, if, if there's nothing going on? So I thought the money that was spent looking for uh, Truro as the city of culture wasn't such a bad idea. Thank you. And straight across, the, straight across now to Jeff Williams. Look. One of the greatest assets that Cornwall has is its culture. It really is. The richness in local communities, in larger communities. I was at the, when, when what was he called, the Iron Man came to Red Roof last week. Yeah. Amazing, absolutely amazing. And for me, I'm not a Cornishman, but I found it incredibly moving. Really, I did. And, I know people who complain about what's spent on culture and so on and so forth, but be proud of it. It really is the, Thank you. the backbone of this country. Uh, Graham Winter. Well, I'd, I'd agree with Jeff almost entirely on that. I think you know we have a wonderful culture here, and I think we should celebrate it. I have no idea whether the bid was the right thing to do. Uh, but I think that's absolutely the reason why we get so many tourists down here. It's not just for the beaches, but it is for our diverse culture uh, and scenery. So we, we should celebrate. Thank you. And uh, finally, George, just this, please. I think there's a couple of points. Uh, I think Jason's absolutely right in the, the nature of the question he poses. There's, a, there's an issue here around priorities, as I said earlier. Well, you know, when budgets are tight, you do have to pick and choose. You have to weigh one thing against another. And I'm just not sure this was the right way to spend that money. I do agree that culture is important, and actually I love it to get um, £100,000 from the government to go into a culture fund. 
And I would simply pose this, you know, what if Cornwall Council, rather than spending half a million pounds on a speculative bid, probably won't come off anyway? What if they had actually... Please. What please. If they, please. Well, there was a plan to, but what if they were actually to put that money, uh, a small amount of it, uh, into a fund that was available to small voluntary organisations in Cornwall that celebrate our industrial heritage, our culture, our language, uh, they could have made that money go a lot further. I think there's a second point I'd make, is this. Why has it always got to be about Turing? You know, Red Roof is the home of the Cornish diaspora. Six million people worldwide who trace their roots back to their dreams. Turo doesn't have that global link and that global reach in the way that Red Roof does. Thank you. A gentleman with his, a piece of paper in his hand there. Um, this is a two-part question. Uh, to start with, uh, to Jeff Williams, the Liberal candidate. Uh, the last time your party had any position of power, you chose to side with the Conservatives over the Labour pointing the Conservatives in government. Which party would you choose to join with this time? <laughs> and the second part, how will that choice affect the Lib Dems' policy to ignore the democratic decision by the people of Britain and Cornwall and instead cancel Brexit? <laughs> Interesting question. I, I think it only fairs to direct that to Jeff Williams. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I got the, the, the gist of it. I don't, I'm afraid I didn't get the last bit of the, of the um, specific. Who, who are the Lib Dems going to go into... into um, well, Tim Farron has made it perfectly clear we're not going in with anybody. Um, we will not go into Germany. I should say, um, your party has decided to cancel Brexit, is that right? Does that change? Sorry, I'm, it's a bit echoey. I'm afraid I can't... It's a bit echoey at this end. Uh, the okay, I'll try again. Okay, so... The Liberal Democrats have announced that they're planning to beat up Brexit if they get in. Yeah, so the Lib Dems have said that they're going to veto Brexit. Yeah. Okay. So, how is that any part of a democratically elected system? And at what point would you side with the Conservatives again just to get a taste of the table? Right, there we go. Uh, what, what, so, are, what do you say about visa and Brexit? Mm. Is that democratic? And just how far down the road will it be this time before the Lib Dems go into some sort of coalition? I think that's a pretty fair but, reflection of the question. But, but, let me address the last bit first, because you said, how long will it be this time? Well, last time was the first time, and there won't be a next time. There we go. That clear. Um, as far as... The Bre as far as Brexit is concerned, look, we are starting from the point we accept. Last year, the people, the, the people, mark you, the people of this country voted to leave the EU. It wasn't the government who voted, it was people sitting here who voted to leave or did not vote to leave. Now, I don't think that we should entrust the final decisions on the terms of Brexit to a little cadre of ministers stuck in Westminster. I think, I think that decision on the terms of any negotiated exit, and we, we have no idea of the terms, we have no idea what the government is going to be negotiating for, except that it is a hard Brexit. I think, um, I didn't quite catch that comment, but um, I think um, that was a question that was fairly specifically aimed at uh, the Lib Dems. I think with the consent of the other three candidates, we can move on. To, uh, George? No, I just wanted to say Sorry. So I was just going to finish the point I was making about uh, returning to the, to the country to say to people in a referendum, look, these are the terms that we have negotiated with Europe. Are you happy with them? And if we say, as a nation, no, we're not happy, then we should have the opportunity to think again about actually leaving Europe. Briefly, Briefly please. Yes, I think the issue here is after that referendum, some of you will remember there was 
lots of legal discussion about triggering Article 50, which was starting the formal process. And the gentleman is right, because the Liberal Democrats, along with the Scottish Nationalist Party, were the only parties who voted against that, effectively voting to ignore the referendum result and not to commence those negotiations. And I think that's wrong, because, look, I was on the Leave side, but I also recognise it was quite a close result. And what we all now need to do is to respect the result and actually work together on a new type of partnership with Europe where we can have free trade, where we can cooperate on common issues such as the environment, but crucially where we no longer have uh, EU law having jurisdiction in the UK, so we become a properly independent country again, but that still means we can cooperate. And what we've got to do is to stop refighting last year's debate and actually just get on with the job of getting a successful Brexit and putting in place that new partnership that everyone can be happy with. Thank you. Jeff Barber, that's a few more words. Uh, this is a subject close to my heart, and I won't spend very long on it. But, We've got uh, lots of questions to come. Yes, I, I, I understand that. But uh, the vote to leave the European Union broke my heart. I really, I just cannot believe that the country that I came back to, having worked overseas, has started to turn in on itself and pull up its doors. This is one of the... One other point I would make, I would take issue strongly with the questioner who then said we all knew what we were voting for when we voted leave. Nobody, nobody knows what we're voting for. We don't know yet what we're going to get, which is why it's important, and the Green Party also accepts this, that we should have a second referendum once the once the, the, the agreement has been made and we have negotiated and we know what the terms are. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you. Right. Um, I think I should offer Graham Winter a, a comment here. Yeah, I, I'd just like to say that, I mean, it was very divisive, and I think it really hurt our country uh, having a referendum last time. I, I, I can't imagine what a referendum on the deal will look like, because it won't be a simple question. There will be a package of clauses about 100, 200, 300 different things, some of which you will like, some which you will like, some you won't like, some you won't like. How are you going to answer that question when you've got two or 300 clauses, some you like, some you don't? It's just an excuse to prolong the agony for longer. Sorry, we need to get on with it and get the best deal we can. Thank you. Um, there is a lady. Um, the lady here is... Um, there's a lady here, and then we'll go to the gentleman at the back. So we've got the lady here. Just thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Vivian Campbell. My witness over the last several years is the building of Bosloe, the latest basically slum development where the houses are completely destroyed. Mr. Eustace, you stood very proudly in a photograph in the West Britain, didn't you? In front of those houses, we find out embarrassing to drive past them. Windows broken. Specific development um, called Bo Boslowen, I believe. Yeah. Thank you. Your your question is directed first at George Eustace, so I, or your comment. So I think it's fair best to let George Eustace respond in the first instance to uh, what's been said. Well, look, um, I've said, as always, that I believe in developing brownfield sites before uh, greenfield sites. Please, please, let me answer your question. Let, let the reply. Um, I think if you look at the developments we've had, some have definitely been way better than others. So I give a good... Please. Um, it comes please. down to uh, planners getting it right. And I'll come on to Ms Lowell specifically. Um, the issue, if you look, I think, at Treview Road, where you had the old Holman's faction, 
you actually see there some really tasteful housing done that uh, is, it basically reflects the historic architecture. This is at the train station. Do you think anybody would just... Uh, I know. Please. I'm just going to give you the example. So that's a good example of where they've got it right. They've got sawtooth roofing. They've kept some of the original building, the apprentice building. I think if you look at Heartlands, they've got it right. Again, on that front, they've actually got short sawtooth roofing. Please. Your question. In the case of Buzlow, and I don't think they got it right because they had those three story properties. I'm not a planner, I'm not a formal council. It was a decision for the planning committee. Please. There's a key Please. problem that they've got on the Buzlow estate, and they've learned the lesson for the second phase, is around that time a lot of developers were using something called K Rend, which is a type of rendering on the front of the uh, building. Uh, and actually, the truth is, in wet areas with high rainfall like Cornwall, it does not fare well. And they've learned the lesson from that, and you'll see that in the later phases they're doing, they're not doing that. They've got more brickwork, and they've got more traditional masonry, which I believe is the right thing to do. So this comes down to basically planning regulations, in my view, getting the planning regs right, and getting the initial planning right. And that wasn't done in the case of as well. Well, I think uh, I'd like to throw this out. Planning... Uh, rendering and over 50,000 houses coming our way soon. Um, uh, Jeff Winter. Jeff Winter or Graham? <laughs> uh, Graham. I'm getting the G's mixed Too up. Many Jeffs. Too, Too many, many Jeffs. Jeffs. We'll, we'll all call ourselves Jeff. We'll all be Jeff. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Graham Winter. Sorry, I apologise. As I understand it, this particular development was, you know, the, the people that are in charge of these developments and making sure they're being built properly, frankly, are called the council. Uh, so, you know, they have a lot of responsibility there for checking these projects as they start and as they progress to make sure they're being built to standards. And clearly these were not built to standard. Uh, aside from that, uh, the lady's right, that you know, the whole planning aspect of it is wrong. Uh, you know, we've now got a major road going right through the middle of that estate. It's really narrow, there's no parking. Uh, and, and it's the main road through to the link road. So it was really badly planned. But again, I'm not sure that's entirely George's fault. Uh, some of the things about planning that, are, that, that, that can be read at, at government is the fact that developers have, are, are able to ride roughshod over local decisions. Uh, and we've seen several local decisions in Campbell and in Truro where large scale developments have taken place on Greenfield land after Cornwall Council had turned them down. They appeal and they get permission to go ahead. So we're losing our Greenfield land. They're allowed to build them without building the right connection roads without the right infrastructure. Again, you know, on the Bosloan estate, we were, we, the, the earlier drafts, and there were several drafts of the plans included, doctor's surgery, extra classrooms, probable primary schools, green spaces, and they've disappeared. Uh, the green space that's left is, is about to be built on. They're putting planning for that now. So, you know, they ride off of that. Local decisions need to remain local. I want to stop them overriding it at the top. Jeff Williams, any comment on that, please? Well, just, just, just briefly, um, over the decades, we've, we've seen numerous occasions when houses, let's put it bluntly, have just fallen down because they've been built either badly or with the wrong materials. And we, one of the lessons I would have hoped that we would have learnt since the mid-1960s, when we started to build the wrong sort of housing, uh, is that Housing, new housing, must be built to the highest standard possible. That must be safeguarded by the community. And the best way to do that, uh, which is where I welcome the developments uh, in local government, is that the powers to control planning and development come down to the lowest possible level, which in our case here is the town or parish council, Thank where you. you can go and speak and have your say and that that uh, decision-making should be devolved down, not that it then, as Graham has pointed out, goes back up to another authority and from there can even just be overruled by a visiting inspector or even a non-visiting mm. inspector mm. sitting in an office in Bristol. Well, thank you. Um, less cladding and more granite, Jeff Garvin. Um, well, I can concur with, uh, with my namesake there, Jeff Williams. As a parish councillor in Carharrock, I'm always a bit stressed by the fact that we're asked 
to, uh, to, to comment on planning applications within the parish and yet they usually when they go to the county planning uh, panel they, they don't take, I don't think they take any notice of what we say at all and recently there was a case where it was the, a planning application was turned down by the parish council, it was turned, by, turned down by the council planning authority and it went up to Bristol and they accepted it. So that's something which I would want to uh, you know, put a stop to with the, the planning should be much more local. And one other thing I would say from a green perspective, and I don't think this is happening at the moment, that all new housing should be zero energy with in terms of insulation, in terms of um, the, uh, the heating of it, and I don't think this is happening at the moment. Thank you. Definite cry here for Labour of Plans, by the look of it. Um, I'd like to go to the gentleman at the back with, with there, and then across to the uh, gentleman with the white t shirt and the grey top. So, thank you. Hello. Um, Hello. I used to live in Islington North, and I wanted to enter an MP seat, but I couldn't because the Labour Party was in the evening. I attempted to supply him with a cannabis plant. He declined my invitation. But he did tell me that he was pro um, the legalisation of cannabis. And I wondered if the um, people would give a yes or no answer as to whether they think that cannabis should be legalised in order to raise taxes, because you can tax it, um, and that would provide a lot of money. Yes, it does, sir, and that would be a very good way to highlight that, and then the person would receive the treatment instantly, couldn't they? Yes, so, your question is, should Basically, should cannabis be legalised or not? And you, you'd like me to get a yes no answer out of our four candidates, would you? George Eustis. Uh, no, I don't, because I think it sends uh, the wrong signal. And the issue is this we were talking earlier about mental health. There are actually some quite proven links uh, now between particular schizophrenia and overuse of cannabis. I so think if you legalise it, one just finally I would say, there just are, briefly, yeah. what is true is that some conditions, people with sometimes MS or Parkinson's, some people do find uh, that cannabis has um, an ingredient to it that actually can help with their condition. And there are actually sort of medical tablets you can get that have that, uh, that cannabis extract and can help with those conditions. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Williams, yes or no to cannabis? Um, yes, but I can give some... Um, Explanation if that's helpful. Briefly, not give some colours yeah, at the no, moment, no, hopefully. No, no, no. <laughs> I've been in mental health, as I mentioned earlier, for 20 years. I've seen so many cases where cannabis or consumption of soft drugs, harder drugs, but particularly cannabis, can contribute to a, and generally to a young person's mental health. But the reason that, they're at, that they're currently there is access to mental health is through the street corner dealers. Those are the people that we need to get rid of. And I firmly believe that one way to do that is to regulate the sale of uh, cannabis in the same way as we regulate the sale of other, uh, other uh, commodities like alcohol. Uh, we don't have a free sale of alcohol. I don't think we should have a free sale, even if it is illicit, of cannabis. Thank you. Grey Winter, cannabis, yes or no? Uh, oh, I can't have a don't know then, right. <laughs> well, you can have a don't know if you like. You know, so. No, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure the uh, case is proven for open legalisation of it. There are clearly, clearly areas where its use is beneficial. Uh, and I think it should, that should be prescribed through those routes. Available on prescription. Uh, Jeff Garber? Um, well, I think the word that's normally used is decriminalisation, and I certainly would 100% support that. I don't think the current law works. It's not stopping young people having access to marijuana and often make, making a mess of themselves. The police have not been really interested anymore. My sister was just telling me today, um, there's uh, down in Penzance, she frequently sees, uh, smells uh, young children, not children, sort of young, young people, smoking cannabis in the park uh, where she's the chairman. And she got in touch with the police to say, straight away to hope they would come down. They just said there's nothing much we can do about that. So it's virtually legal already, and yet, we, and yet the people who use it have to get it from criminals. 
And the, the normal story is, and there's certainly a fair bit of truth in it, these criminals selling cannabis to them might well want to get them onto harder drugs. If, if people are going to use it, and they will, then it needs to be regulated, it needs to be something that we've got some control of. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi. My question is towards George, uh, well, basically reds and blues. My first one is towards Labour. Um, when are they going to, I believe in the party, or when are they going to stop stabbing each other in the back and getting a room in the back court? You can't run a country if the party doesn't get along. Uh, so I think that's a, a question for our Labour uh, yes, candidate. Yes, that's for the Labour. So when, when are Labour going to stop? Stabbing each other in the back. Yeah, basically, you can get a mortgage. Well, the country is divided. That's a, a fairly Labour Party yeah. centric question. So, the only other one is it's George. I'm going I'm to ask Graham Winter to respond to that. It's a Labour centric thing. Yeah. It, I, I think they'll stop stabbing each other in the back next Friday. <laughs> because a, a, lot of, a lot of the doubts people have about uh, our leader, and I presume that's what you're talking about, is, good is, is the fact that. They worry that he's unelectable. And the reason they think that they, they worry that he's not electable is because of the way the media treats him and the way they know the media. <laughs> and, and, and because the media will carry on doing that up until polling day, in fact, next Thursday you'll see the headlines about you know, do you want this man? Uh, running the country and, and with whatever slant they put on it, they know it. They, the worry is that he's not electable to the majority. I think the polls are turning that around. I think the fact that we're in an election period where, in theory, we get fairer coverage uh, is turning that around because a lot of people are seeing him for, for what he is and they're not seeing somebody to be scared of. Interesting. Um Opinion polls, who believes them except the, the pollsters? Uh, George Eustace, any comment on this? Sir? No, I think it's very much no, a Labour question. It's a Labour centric yeah. thing, but <laughs> to be fair. Graham, I'm just pleased to. Uh, um, Jeff Garbutt? Uh, again, I think Graham has given quite a good answer. I think it's very sad. We need, we need a strong opposition, and I really hope that. The Labour Party get themselves together, get themselves organised. There we go. Otherwise, we're going to be in a one party state, and that won't be any good for anybody, not even George. Jeff Williams? Well, I think it's the curse of our modern age that our political debates at election time are based more on the personality of leaders than actually on the policies that their parties are taking. The sooner we get past comparing the uh, qualities or non-qualities of Theresa May against Jeremy Corbyn, against Tim Farron, Caroline Lucas, whoever, the better this country will fare. So do away with this personality cult, personality politics. Let's go for policy politics. Yeah. Gentleman there with the blue shirt. Um, Sorry, one question. Uh, Sorry. One question each on the first. Redruth served my uh, fantastic comprehensive school, Redruth School. The Redruth School seeks to serve uh, all the children in this community, from those who struggle and have special needs to those who are going to be high achievers and go to Cambridge to be doctors and to serve them. How would the least able children? in Red Roof be served by a grammar school system. Graham Winter, grammar schools. They won't. <laughs> we, we don't believe in elitism. Education, we believe in the best education for every single individual. That's it. George Yusuf, please, sir. Well, look, the issue here on grammar schools is that probably from the 1960s right through the 70s and early 80s, right across the country, there was a gradual drift towards a comprehensive system. Uh, but grammar schools were never abolished. 
And then in what can only really be described as an act of vindictiveness, in 97, the new Labour government only Tony Blair made it an offence uh, to open uh, new grammar schools. And I think that was wrong because there had already been uh, quite a mixed approach. Most parts of the country <coughs> decided, and parents supported this, to go towards a more comprehensive system, but some did it. And what we are saying is, uh, let's let not go back to a kind of total grammar school, uh, secondary modern system, but let's not at least uh, rule out the option of making an offence to open uh, a grammar school. Because what we're seeing uh, in many parts of the country, uh, and right here, for instance, I think we've got some really, really strong secondary schools. But if you look at uh, Campbell School, for instance, they've set up something called Nexus, which is all about effectively like a, an extra level of setting where they really push our children who are great at science, great at maths, and Please. they really try and stretch those. Uh, and I think that's really just an extension of setting, and I think it's a positive thing. But while you've got some of this legislation put in place and you're making an offence, actually schools who try novel things like that, who are inclusive schools, and who and can have anyone join them, but actually sometimes set up uh, these special dedicated units to really uh, enable children to get on and really achieve in science and maths and uh, English and other things. They're actually facing legal jeopardy for that. And you know, there are parts of the country where actually we've got failing schools. And you have a kind of selection now that parents can afford it by houses in posh areas uh, where the schools are better. And there are parts uh, of the country where that doesn't happen. And all we're saying is let's not rule, let's not Please. rule out let's not rule out at least the option uh, where it would work to have uh, more of a grammar school type uh, approach. And we've been really clear as well, it's very important, right, that the, any, any new grammar school uh, would only be allowed in those areas where there was a real failure in the, in the state education system, and also that they'd have to partner with some of those other schools to ensure that uh, standards across the board were raised. Thank you. Of course, an absolutely first class uh, School in Madrid. Jeff Garbutt, any comment on this, sir? Uh, yes, lots of comments. I've been teaching for nearly 40 years, so uh, this, these issues are very close to my heart. First point I'd like to make to George is that you ought to remember that the Nexus uh, part of um, Cameron School was originally a free school. It worked very well. A lot of, a lot of A lot of money seems to go into these pet projects, and, and that, I mean, I think as far as I can see, this idea of getting back grammar schools is a pet project of Theresa May. There is no evidence whatsoever that grammar schools improve social mo mobility. The, the, the evidence from education research is all in the opposite direction. We need to make, ensure that all of our schools are good schools, and not tell children at the age of 11, well, you're all right, you know, you can go to the posh school, you failed. Oh no, you haven't failed, it's just that you've been selected for a, a second, well, a different education. Is 11 the right time to do it? Is 11 the time to, for, for young children to, to suddenly find that they're not good enough, they can't go to the school with the posh kids? I just think it's appalling and it's because so much, so many of the decisions that are being made by politicians are not based on evidence, they're based on half-baked ideas, they're bringing back Yeah. 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 Grammar schools. Grammar schools. Well, there is no way that the introduction of grammar schools will benefit the majority of youngsters, uh, either in this constituency or anywhere else. What we need to do to improve the opportunities, to enhance the opportunities for young people, as far as the schools are concerned, is to free up the teachers to do what they do best, and that is teach. <laughs> rather, rather, than having to, rather than having to treat their, their, their children in, the school, in, the, in, their, in their schools as objects for a tick box exercise, which is frankly what it has become. Compare your own education with school when you were at school, particularly the older members of the audience. You all had some inspirational teacher, someone you can remember when you, uh, when you were in your middle age. Oh, I remember also, oh, he was good, wasn't he? There is no room for that sort of teaching anymore because teachers are so constrained 
by a curriculum imposed from above, which does not necessarily suit the children that they're teaching, or expand their life vision, that the charismatic teacher has gone. And it is good teaching and it is good leadership which will extend the life chances of our children, not building selection schools. Um, Thank you. I'll leave you. Okay. Okay. Gentlemen, then, I'm trying to sort of spread the rest. No, I mean, Chris Hines, I went to a comprehensive school. Um, my question is, on a day that um, Donald Trump in pants shocked the world and withdrew from the Paris Climate Change Agreement, where's Theresa May and her leadership? Does that really represent where our country's going to go? Fracking, you mentioned, you mentioned renewables. You can't have much confidence in that now. She's got no leadership whatsoever. Question. I'm going to ask. I'm, it's it's an environmental, <coughs> environmentally based question you're asking. I'm going to ask Jeff Garvey to respond first of all, and then over to George Eustace, and then to our other um, panel members. Well, I'd say straight away that Theresa May's response, which was basically no response, a spokesperson saying she told Donald uh, Donald Trump that she was disappointed. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> This is the strong, stable leader who's going to lead us through and the Brexit negotiations. It's laughable. Yeah. Thank you. Is that all I get? That's a shock box. As, as I said right at the start, the environment, our environment is central, is our central political reality. And not nearly enough attention is being made, for example, to, well, in, in this particular instance, to climate change. It's with us now, and the disruption it's going to occur, not just to us because we're going to have slightly warmer summers, to the whole world. It's already happening. Massive movements of people. Wars. Goodness knows what else. It's, it's coming, and it's coming quickly. We have to do everything we can to stop it. It's the, it's the most important issue facing us at the moment. And to treat it in the kind of half-baked way that the Tory government have since they, since they you know, not really taking it seriously, getting rid of the climate change ministry, etc., is just not good enough. Thank you. <laughs> George Eustace, please, sir. Well, look, the UK disagrees with the US on this, and we are committed to the Paris Agreement. And, uh, of course, it's disappointing for everyone that the US have taken this decision. But, you know, if you really care about the environment, um, then you don't just do grandstanding and shout. What you do, oh. let me finish, what you actually do, and the US have kept the door open to rejoining uh, elements of this. And the real task now is to get them back on board, uh, taking seriously commitments to climate change, uh, notwithstanding the decision they've taken, which obviously is disappointing. And that is what we should be doing. Uh, and, and that is where the UK has probably got a powerful role to play, and that is what we will be doing. And the US has kept the door open to Thank you, um, that special relationship. Uh, uh, Graham Winter. Uh. Well, yes, well, I'd agree. Climate change is you know, the most serious thing facing this planet at the moment. Uh, you know, in, in, in your children's generation, there will be big changes in this world. Uh, it's, it's really worrying uh, that the biggest polluter on the planet doesn't realise that it's happening. Uh, we, we, <laughs> We, we, we just we, we have to get it through to them, and even redoubling our own efforts is not going to help. You know, we can't we can't just do more towards helping the climate ourselves if they're not going to get on board. We really have to uh, get the message across to them. Uh, I mean, and there was some hope in the words Donald Trump used. It did, did set some hope there might be some other negotiation. But, but you know, in, in spite of all the efforts we've got in our manifestos about renewable energy, about stopping fracking and all those kind of things, they will be dwarfed by what is going to happen in America with the way they're going on, on fossil fuels. Uh, it really is serious. Now, I don't know what the answer is to get it done, but we have to get the message through to them somehow. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, well, well, it's, you know, it's pretty disastrous, isn't it? There's one... one glimmer of hope in that being a federal state, places like California and New York can go their own way and they're going to be sticking with the Paris uh, Accord. 
Um, as far as Mrs. May's reaction to uh, Donald Trump's decision is concerned, well, um, you know, pretty feeble, to be honest, pretty feeble. And she is paying the price of her hard stance on Brexit because Mrs. May cannot afford to upset the Americans. She is going to be totally, if not totally, then to a very large degree on trade with the United States once we're out of Europe, losing the biggest market that we have at the moment. She just cannot afford to upset Mr. Trump. As we saw, well, she likes to hand, hold hands with him, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> um, gentleman here, I think. Um, do you agree with the increase in the use of food banks from 29,000 in 2008 to almost 1,182,000 last year is down to badly managed universal credit system and a disregard for the normal brown society? Thank you. We have a very successful and uh, well supported food bank, of course, in the uh, in this town and wider constituency. Uh, Graham Winter. Well, I'm grateful you've got a well supported food bank, but why have you got a food bank? Yeah. What are we the fifth largest economy in the world? We've got a million people going to food banks. What's that? What is that about? I mean, George will tell us later, I mean, yeah, keep mentioning it. Yeah. It's about choices. The government has to make tough choices. Uh, but, but, you know, we have working people. Sorry, but they're not on the unemployed list anyway, uh, because they're working people, many on zero hours contracts. Some on, many, some on much bigger contracts, full-time nurses, we hear, sometimes have to go to food banks. Uh, you know, what kind of world do we want to live in? Uh, I mean, it's wonderful that there's such charity about and people donate it. Uh, but, but really, we have, it's, a, it's a scourge in our society and a sad reflection on the choices this government has made. We have to get rid of them. Jeff Williams. Yeah, thank you. My, my wife volunteers at the local food bank and comes back with some sad tales. Um, poverty amongst the working people, not the non-working, is growing, as highlighted. Um, and that's one reason, perfectly blunt, that we want to remove the cap on public um, uh, salaries, salaries in the public sector, so that people like nurses don't have to go to a food bank to get food. Um, I'm afraid, for the last ten years or so, they have been inevitable. I hope they won't be inevitable over the next five years, whoever gets back into government. Thank you. Jeff Garber, Food Banks. The responsibility of a government is to ensure that <coughs> the, po the, the people that they serve are safely, warmly, carefully housed, that they're able to feed themselves and their family, that they can live in safety, and that they have access to uh, medical care when they, when they need it. These are the basic requirements that any government should provide. But the way this government has been behaving, and, and the coalition before it, I'm afraid to say, is to actually, uh, while they cut things like corporation tax and tax for the, for the best paid, and who has had to pay for this? The people who services at the bottom end, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the lower um, earners have had their services cut, their standard of living has had to fall. As uh, Graham pointed out, I mean, even nurses and people in work are having to use food banks. This isn't the way to govern a country. The priorities must be to ensure that everybody has these basic rights. And if that means that people at the, people at the top have to sacrifice their Mercedes Benzes and goodness knows what else, then so be it. But we've just got things the wrong way around at the moment. George We've always had projects uh, that have delivered food aid, things like the Salvation Army, lots of good projects down the years. And the truth is that food banks are quite a recent phenomenon right around the world. Uh, in France, uh, there's around a million people that use food banks. The same is true in the US, the same is true in Germany. And, you know, the question was specifically around benefits. I don't think it is just around benefits because people uh, were saying it was because of late payments. Uh, 
on the benefits, but the truth is over 90% uh, are paid one time now, and that was, compares to uh, just 85% around uh, 10, 10 years ago. Um, so other people Thank you. would say um, it's down to sanctions, but the number of sanctions has halved uh, just in the uh, last two years. Um, the truth is that I send my uh, local office along to the food bank regularly to try to help people who've got problems uh, in their lives. Quite often, uh, these are people who aren't even aware of what they're entitled to, and my office often help them to put in the application to get the benefits that they are uh, entitled to. Uh, quite often as well, um, they are people who are not on benefits but are working and have a knock in their life. Maybe the car breaks down, they get a big bill, they've got bailiffs at the door, they get in the hands of loan sharks. There are lots and lots of complex reasons uh, why people find themselves using food banks. You know, we should, we should recognise the, the good work um, that they do, but it is wrong to simplistically say this is something to do with universal credit. I think far from it. Uh, it's not to do with the benefit system. It's much more complex than that. Got a question here from the lady here. Can I just a question? The speaker is on its way, the, the microphone. Yes. Question what George Eustace has just said because I also volunteer at Food Bank and I would say that the vast majority of our clients come with problems with benefit suspension, benefit delay. <laughs> Interestingly enough, because you don't get a, um, a food parcel simply by walking through the door, you have to have um, a voucher which entitles you to one, and those vouchers are given out by people like CAB, mm. um, a doctor's surgery, mm. and so on. They are also given out by the job centre. And quite recently we noticed that the vast majority of our vouchers are given out by the job centre. Right. The job centre realises that it's due to the suspension of benefit, particularly in universal credit, that is causing this huge number of people walking through the door. And because we have such an increase, and because also the cost of food has gone up, unfortunately, donations have gone down. So we're in the unfortunate position of having to reduce the amount of food we can give. The situation is not getting better, it's getting worse. I'm going to let Mr. Reeves just respond to that. Just to, to briefly um, come back on that. I mean, when I talk to Don Gardner, who organises the one in Campbell, he's very clear that actually they're trying to move the food banks on to help people with the complex problems they've got in their life, whether it's helping them to get back into employment or to deal with mental health issues or whatever else. And so they're trying to broaden their offer so that it's not just about um, crisis support. On, on the job centre point, under the last Labour government, they, they were banned from actually signposting people to help like food banks. They weren't allowed to. One of the things we did was remove that restriction so that job centres, if they felt it was appropriate, could signpost people to food banks. And the other final thing I'd say is one of the things we've done as well is to introduce hardship payments to make it much, much easier for people to access that so that even if they do have a problem with a delay on their benefits, they can access those hardship payments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, somebody's been stood up there for an hour, I think. <laughs> Just briefly, because um, we're, we're running out of time. This one's just for George. Hey, hey. hey. Uh, Basically, don't class us as officers when a group of peers are paid wages. So, see us like that. Basically, why are you under police investigation? Even if you're found guilty, the fact that you're going to be called for and you've sold us Cornish out as a Cornish for yourself. Why would you do that? If you're not fiddling expenses, you're in the right room, there's a lovely man in the cloth here, there's no need to would you be willing to put your hand on the Bible, sir, and say, I have not sold all now and I have not fiddled my expenses? Well, thank you. Um, I, uh, just to summarise, I think that touches upon uh, the subject of MPs being under investigation recently. Um, and for some length of time indeed, over expenses and election expenses. Um, obviously the police investigated and uh, those papers went to the Crown Prosecution Service. I think it's fair to let George Eustace open on this one. Yes, I'm not on the police investigation. Uh, there was a politically motivated allegation. Yes, there was. Please. I and a number of other... Uh, just let me finish. If I could Please. Yeah. And I and a number of other MPs have not declared um, the, the fuel for a bus that travelled the country. Uh, 
on their election expenses. Great. The police investigated it, the Crown Prosecution Service looked at it, they agreed that the case was unfounded, there was no case to answer, there is no prosecution, there is no investigation. Sir, your, your claims are utterly false. Um, Graham Winter, please, please, this isn't the House of Commons. <laughs> We know how to behave in Rudruth, not like the bear pit. Grey Winter. Well, it's not really my place to comment, but I, I, believe, I believe the, the result was the CPS thought it wasn't in the public interest to proceed, which might be slightly different. I think, other, I think to add balance to this, um, MPs have all, a, a, a number of MPs have been investigated Thank over you. the past many years, haven't they? And, uh, they have, yes. And so on and so forth. Um, Jeff Williams. Uh, well, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not going to comment on George's particular no, case. He's no. expe explained the situation. Um, there is currently an investigation to another MP, I think, which was announced today. Um, but let's face it, these sort of inquiries by, by the police, by, by Parliament itself, as applied to members of all parties, uh, I don't think any party can have to stand up and say, but, uh, they are totally free of stain. Thank you. So, so. Jeff Garvick, finally on this particular topic. Right, this is an interesting one because if you keep your eye on the news, actually one of the Tory MPs who was investigated is now in trouble. I'm not quite sure. The, the MP for Thanet, I think. Um, I think you would agree with this, George, if you've been listening to the news today. So it looks as though it wasn't sort of crystal clear that nothing was going wrong. I listen very carefully to the judgment of the or at least the analysis of the uh, judgment of the Crown Prosecution Service. And it wasn't that nothing had gone wrong, it was that they couldn't uh, find the evidence that the, the agents of the MPs were able, when knew what was happening, there was, they didn't have sufficient evidence to show that any, any laws were... That they didn't have sufficient evidence to show that laws were being broken, but it wasn't that anyone was absolutely in the clear. It's just difficult to find evidence that people knew that what they were doing was wrong. Thank you. Gentlemen, the, the beer? Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I'd like to bring the uh, discussion around to uh, question of employment, specifically uh, self-employment. Uh, I like many people in Cornwall, and um, my own age, uh, self-employed, though I wouldn't pass as being an entrepreneur with a you know, dollar size in the eyes. I've got a goal of being modestly self-employed and to uh, make self-employment work for me in the same way as um, employment uh, as working for somebody else. What would your party do to bring uh, similar employment rights to, uh, as I uh, experienced by people who are employed by companies to those who, like myself, are self -employed? Self-employment and uh, employment rights. Um, Grey Winter. Hello. I'm probably not going to give a very long answer on that one, Frank, because I'm not that particularly well briefed. Uh, the, some of the things for small businesses in particular uh, that they have trouble with is around finance, and the, the National Investment Bank that, that, they, that they want to set up will be specifically targeted at a set of people setting up small business and innovation. So I'd hope that fund, typically entrepreneurs have, have difficult getting access to, to that kind of funding. So that, that is one area where we, where we would be able to help. Uh, the other thing on, on, on small businesses in particular, uh, Labour has, it wants to reintroduce the low rate, there used to be a lower rate of corporation tax for small businesses under a certain threshold, they want to reintroduce that. This is the one to raise the one for the big corporations. Uh, so that, that makes it more fair for the smaller businesses and, and remove some of the reporting requirements they have as well for small businesses uh, instead of quarterly reporting just to return to annual reporting. Just make life a little bit easier for, uh, for, for the smaller businesses. Thank you. George Eustace. I, I think the gentleman asked a question might have been getting at um, an interesting fact, which is there's quite a blurring now these days between self-employment and employment in a formal way in, in the, the main economy. Uh, well, they, I don't know, for whatever reason they call it the gig economy. And this is where you've got uh, increasingly uh, courier drivers, um, you know, everybody shopping on the internet now. Quite often these people are, to all intents and purposes, in a sort of employed uh, role in their delivery, but they are technically self-employed. 
And I think the general gives the finger on an important point here, which is, you know, sometimes the, the rights that they might get to holiday, to that kind of thing, they're not uh, getting, even though uh, it's effectively um, very, very close to what an employed van driver uh, might be doing. So we've committed in our manifesto to look at this whole area, uh, and in this um, kind of grey area between self-employment and employment in, a, in, in the economy, actually try and strengthen the rights for people working in that, uh, in that gig economy. Obviously then for what you might call your more traditional small business people, um, we've always been really clear that we should try to ease the burdens on them in the administration, that we should uh, try to support them to, to actually grow their businesses, and that's always been uh, you know, a strong uh, belief, a strong feature of the Conservatives. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Williams. Um, yeah, small businesses, sole entrepreneurs, the backbone of the economy in Cornwall. And so much more can be done from so much has, has been done, and the rolling out of the fast internet down to even the far reaches. Well, I'm not quite sure how far it's got yeah, down to West, West Cornwall. Uh, not as far as Camborne, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> it's beyond Camborne. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that, that is obviously going to help um, when we are geographically so far from um, where the centre of things currently are in um, Europe uh, and London. Um, but there is so much more that can be done in terms of uh, grant support for small businesses, make it easier. Um, to deregulate to a certain extent, uh, but also ensure that uh, em easier access to labour markets, all sorts of things. Um, I'm not a small business person. Um, I don't think my wife would trust me with a small business. I'd probably spend all the money. Um, but um, funnily enough, I was replying to a lady today on small business, uh, issues around small business. And I can't remember what I told her. <laughs> Uh, but uh, if anybody, if the gentleman would like a copy of the manifesto, I should be very happy to provide well, you. Well, there's an offer. <laughs> Jeff Garvey. Uh, I must admit I was delighted to hear what uh, George said just now about the gig economy. Uh, these bogus self-employed um, contracts are really are a bad deal. I know very much my own personal family experience about that, and uh, it really won't do. I mean, workers' rights have been fought for really hard. And now there's this sort of back door of getting out of, uh, of providing them. The other thing I would like to say from the Green Party point of view, we have a policy to set up a green investment bank, <coughs> preferably from the nationally, owned, the nationally owned part of RBS. So that would be used as a green investment bank to enable uh, businesses to get off the ground, particularly those with, uh, with, with green credentials. Thank you. We've got just about time for a couple more questions. We've got one at, one at the back. Yeah, sorry. We've got a, a lady at the back. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'd like to know how we can improve skills and earning in Camden where we can pay off. We have a very low high skills rate and a very low earnings rate. I'd like to know how that can be improved and how your part will help improve um, the, um, the outcome in Camden where we can pay off and improve the aspirations of the community. Just to re reaffirm your question, how, how are we going to improve skills and higher skills and higher earnings and aspirations? Higher skills, earnings and aspirations within this constituency. George Eustace. Yeah. Um, there's three points. I think the, the first thing is, in terms of higher skills, we put a huge amount of emphasis on apprenticeships and really raising the status of apprenticeships. We've had nearly two million new apprenticeships since uh, 2010, and they've been very successful at helping people go on to higher, um, higher wages, higher level employment. The, the second point, in terms of raising wages, it's not just about skills, it's also about getting industries to locate here. We've now got something like 400 different people working in the computer software company in Poole and Madrid. It's a great example of a new industry that's developed around a cluster in this area that's created the right kind of workspace, the right kind of working environment for them. So people like Bluefruit, NetBooster, uh, and Head Forward Software, a group of companies actually employing quite a lot of people, paying good salaries. Uh, and on your final point around aspiration, 
Look, I think uh, all of our schools in this area do a fantastic job of trying to raise the aspiration of young people. Uh, all of them I've seen strengthen, get better and better uh, you know, in the last 10 years or so. In my time as an MP, they've got stronger every year, their results have got better. We've got secondary schools that we can be proud of. Uh, and I think they're actually doing very, very, very well and we're raising their aspiration. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Garber. Um, the aspirations is certainly the thing that, uh, that rings in my mind here because it's important that the education that our young children uh, receive develops the whole person, not just driving them on with these sats and all these kind of things to be good at English and maths and, and then just sticking the other things on as sort of an afterthought. Our schools are turning into production lines as far as I can see. Turning out fodder for, for a growth economy and, and, and perhaps many, many years in very dull jobs. I think we need to move in a different direction altogether. And, uh, and, and certainly the Green Party's vision of the future isn't one where we're just pushing all the time for everybody to be involved in growing the economy, regardless of the effects of that uh, on individuals and on the environment. Thank you. Jeff Williams, please. Giving young people aspiration is, is one of the hardest things and they're going to have to aspire to achieve something in a successful economy, in a successful community. Nothing breeds success more than success itself. And when youngsters who go through school um, have a successful school career, uh, despite the pressures, and thanks to the teachers, um, then when they leave, they're faced with enormous challenges then. Uh, there is the issue of, f higher, f first of all, further education. Then there's the question of higher education. Not everybody will want to go for higher education. Not everybody will, well, everybody has to these days, go for further education. And there are means, there are ways that we can actually help that pathway. Um, even at the most basic level, by helping with Access. I mean, we're, we're in our manifesto, we're proposing a, a, a youngster's bus pass subsidised up to two thirds, you know, so that they can actually travel from a remoter village into college in, in Campbell. That sort of thing. Thank you. We can help people, uh, youngsters, on the housing ladder. There are so many ways that we can actually help young people into work. But we need to ensure that our community, uh, that our economy is thriving, so that, that gives them something to aspire to. Thank you. Uh, Graham Winter, please. Uh, aspiring young people, yes. We, we have to. A, 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 a lot of young people, I'd say actually quite a few parents uh, that I've spoken to, have aspirations that their children will come back to Cornwall once they've had their wonderful education at university. Mm. But sadly, when they're sadly with 40 to 50,000 pounds of debt, they don't feel the wages back here or the jobs available are going to help them. So, you know, la Labour, Labour is committed to getting rid of the tuition fees. So let's, let's remove that. wide aspirations when they know at 21, 22 they've got that kind of debt already hanging over them is beyond me. Uh, and, but but perhaps, perhaps they won't live up, perhaps their uh, parents' aspirations that they want to come back might not come true either anyway. But uh, we need to give them opportunities back here and, and, and a national minimum wage is something that Labour will introduce by 2020 a minimum wage of £10. But key to the minimum wage is is stopping those that are undercutting it, uh, wherever they're getting their employee, employees from, we must stop them undercutting the minimum wage because that's dragging everybody down. Uh, and we need real jobs here, and, and yeah, George is yeah, right, there are, some, there are some really good new companies setting up down here, and we've got plenty of space for more, so we really need to keep pushing and getting those businesses down here. But they need real jobs, not zero hours contracts jobs. Proper jobs, proper hours, proper skills. Yeah. 
on, 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 on for, 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 further on skills, Labour's intended to set up a national education service, and a part of that will look at the whole of education through life. So they want not just university education for those that, that choose that way, but also to make sure further education is, is available and free for everybody who wants to retrain, take a different tact, learn new skills. So that's really important. It's a really new thing for National Education Service to oversee lifelong learning. Thank you. Thank you. So let me give you Thank you. This is from George Eustace. I'd like You know, the bread and butter work of an MP is to meet people who've got specific problems like that, which often does throw up policy issues, things that aren't working quite as they should do, uh, things where there's a glitch, where there's an anomaly. Uh, and in those instances, I always write to the minister involved, see meetings with them, and try to get those things ironed out and changed. I think yours is a good case in point because, um, you know, I'd, I'd need to look at the full details, but the objective behind the policy, you're right, is to ensure that when people have got a large home uh, but their family have left, that you encourage them to, to downsize to something smaller, to make room for a young family that needs that. And I get lots of people come to my surgery, let me, I get lots of people come to my surgery who've got a growing family, who've got children sharing rooms where they need a bigger house. And part of the way we deal with that, unless we want to carpet the countryside with more houses, is to try and get, make more efficient use of our housing stock and try to encourage people to downsize when they no longer need a big home. So that's the objective, but in your case, you're, from what you've described, you're absolutely right, there's a mismatch between two separate sets of entitlement criteria, uh, and I'm absolutely willing to take that up on your behalf. If I win, and I'm sure anybody else on this panel would be uh, more than happy to meet you and raise this issue. Um, I'm going to throw it open to the rest of the panel for fairness. Um, Jeff Winter? Graham Winter. Um, we're all Jeff. We're all the G's, the G's. I do make a call. Graham Winter. What a simple answer on the... Sorry, the simple answer on the fear of bedroom taxes that Labour will scrap the bedroom tax. There are far too many silly rules about it. Uh, about children having must share a room uh, until they're 16 and things like that. It, 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 it's, it, it's just crazy and they don't even take into account the size of the room. You know, rooms that you can barely get a single bed in count as bedrooms. So you, you have to use it. Or it, it, it counts as a bedroom because it can fit a, just about get a single bed. It doesn't matter if you open the door or not, but you will get penalised if you're not using it. So Jeff, it's crazy. Jeff Williams? Yeah, just for it is Jeff, sorry. <laughs> Just very brief, I did have to remind Graham actually that it was the Labour Party who actually introduced the bedroom tax for um, private landlords, but uh, I'm just glad he's seen the light. Um, yeah, it's got to go. It's as simple as that. I spent those years as a councillor talking to families who came to me uh, to say that they, they were desperate uh, for uh, accommodation for their offspring who were probably in their 20s, and I had to say to them, the only way you're going to get a council house is to make them homeless, because then the council would be obliged to rehouse them. 
Um, there's, there's too much here to discuss in two minutes. Um, but the whole system does need radical change. Thank you. Um, finally on this question, Jeff Garber, please. Sir. Yes, I've just uh, turned to the appropriate page in my Green Party manifesto. So let me off the hook a bit. I'll just read out what it says. Abolish the bedroom tax. Abolish the bedroom tax, which has saved less than £400 million a year. The Department for Work and Pensions report found that more than half of affected tenants have cut back on essentials and only one in 20 has downsized. So it hasn't achieved what it's supposed to achieve, which is to free up the property. It's just made people go hungry. Thank you. Um, we're coming to a close. Um, I think we'll take one, a, a question from another, another lady, and perhaps, perhaps one of our young people present tonight. Yes. So we'll, we'll let the gentleman here ask his question. Um, uh, in the run up to this election, we know there's been a lot of goodies, and one of them is to cut the price of electricity um, by various parties. I do recall the run up that on the going at an election when then Labour leader Edmund Mann suggested that and he was lambasted. So, what circumstances have changed this time that he can do it? And also, bear in mind that major six supply companies are all for an no. Um, the echo here is ter terribly bad, I'm afraid. We're, your question concerns... Capital letter. Do you want me to kick off? Yes, please. Um, well, please, please. Right. In the run-up to this election, as you are well aware, we are all being offered very goodies. One of them is a cap on electricity prices. Yes. Bear in mind that our six major utilities are foreign owned. And also, I do recall, I was on the last one ago, I know as I'm getting up with my mic this morning, but I still can remember when Ed Miliband suggested it, and he was lambasted, stating to the he, he was, you know, he, 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 he was ridiculed. Mm -hmm. So, what circumstances then has changed that we can offer it now? Okay. Well, I'm going to throw that one out to um, Jeff Williams to start with, please. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I still didn't quite catch, you didn't quite catch the question. Um, Graham, are you happy to pick up that one? Yeah. Uh, so, well, I'm not sure what makes the cap on electricity prices uh, a, a, a better this time than it was two years ago. Uh, yes. Next two years ago, Labour Party certainly talked about a freeze for the next two years on prices. Uh, how that would have worked, I, I, I'm not too sure, personally. Uh, Labour Party is offering something different this time in terms of the fact that we would set up a, uh, a, a nationally owned alternative as an energy company. Uh, so we already have a competitive market, so they would enter a, a, a social enterprise or state-owned electricity company, which would be run not for profit, obviously run for the state and for the people, uh, to give people real choice. Uh, and, and, and that would help to keep the prices low because it would be competing with other companies. But as, as the gentleman says, you know, most of the major companies at the moment are all foreign owned and for, owned by sometimes state owned as well. So we need to bear that in mind and maybe we'll, we'll take, make some efforts to uh, set up a state owned alternative energy supply. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Jeff Garber, please. Jeff Garber, on the issue. Well, what I think I'll do here, because I'm getting really rather tired, is just give you a plug for good energy. All our energy comes from renewable sources. I use them and I find them a wonderful uh, company to deal with. I don't know about uh, capping the price. i tell you something that just occurred to me just now. I can, I can assure you this is extremely difficult doing this because stuff is whizzing through your brain. One of the things that occurred to me is how often policies put forward by opposition parties are ridiculed at the time and then picked up immediately afterwards. One of the things the Green Party said in 2015 is we should have a £10 an hour minimum wage by 2020. What a load of nonsense. We couldn't possibly afford that. Now it's policy right across the board. The other thing we said, we've got to build a million homes. What a load of nonsense. And now everyone has the same policies. So it, 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 it's worth listening very carefully to some, some more radical policies that come from opposition parties, but quite, quite often they finish up as mainstream. Thank you. George Eustace, please. I'll deal with the issue first and then the difference. Because um, the issue is, is this. Um, 
I think the energy companies, the big six, have got a case to answer because, you know, it used to be that if you were a loyal customer, you would be treated well, you would, you would get a good deal. But the sad truth is, that it's what's been happening in the energy market in particular, is that if you are a promiscuous customer who shops around, who switches from one year to the next, you get a good deal. If you're a loyal customer, you basically get taken for a ride. And what we're trying to address uh, through this, because particularly the evidence is uh, often more vulnerable groups are less likely to shop around to get that good deal, is to make sure that there is a cap on those standard rate tariffs. Um, and it's a cap, so the market still functions beneath that. People can still shop around to get a better deal. But for those who are less inclined to do that, you protect them from being ripped off. Because what had been happening, what had been happening is basically loyal customers have been ripped off to fund uh, cheap energy for those who shopped around. Now what um, is different from what uh, was proposed by Ed Miliband is he was just proposing a freeze. And as Graham himself conceded, that wasn't really going to work. Because if you freeze them at the top of the market, well the market doesn't work and it doesn't go down when things go down. And you don't allow those uh, competition between the energy companies to drive uh, to drive energy down when there's a, a surplus of supply. So the cap that we've got on the, on the tariff, which basically was recommended by uh, an independent report we commissioned on this, uh, is the right approach, and it is slightly different to what Ed Miliband proposed before. Thank you. And finally, Jeff Williams. Yeah, well, um, I'm looking forward to the day when we don't actually have to worry about switching energy suppliers. Uh, I've done it a few times. Uh, and I think in the future, and I'm looking at some of the youngsters here, in perhaps 20 or 30 years' time, when we all have solar energy, when we all have uh, perhaps little, little windmills in, in our back garden, providing us with the, all the energy that we need, wasn't, won't address gas, and it's a hypothetical situation, but I think it's the future, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but at the moment, yeah, the, the government should cap um, or seek to have capped uh, energy prices. That's all I can say. Thank you. Two more questions. One from the lady there, and I'm going to offer a member of the Youth Council the opportunity to ask a question. And then at the end, I'm going to give each of the um, candidates for election the chance to give a one minute summing up. Okay, so thank you. Um, hi, I'm a primary school teacher. And despite all the challenges that make it very hard for me to stay in the profession, it's a real privilege to be able to care for children. Um, and we see children come in with all sorts of different home lives, and it's our job to remove as many barriers as possible and give them an equal platform and start in life. Given what we just heard about food banks and the number of families that have to go to get food, how can George Eustace justify the Conservatives policy of scrapping free school meals? And what will other parties do to try and make sure that a child's right not to go hungry is fulfilled in this country? Well, that's a, a directed question, so I'm going to pass it right over to, uh, to George. To answer. Um, we are not scrapping free school meals for those uh, who are means tested as needing it under the, the current free school meal programme. What we're, what, no, I know what we're doing, just let me finish. I know what we're, we, we're replacing the universal access of infant age children to um, free lunches, uh, which applies to wealthy parents as well as those uh, who struggle. We're replacing that with a universal right to a free breakfast. And we are still, main, no, we are maintaining, we are maintaining uh, free school meals for those who Please. And the reason, the reason we're doing that Please. is so that we can spend an extra, you know, we're finding an extra four billion pounds a year to redirect into children's education. And you know, when I talk to head teachers, they tell me that this is right, that actually they don't need universal uh, free meals for parents who can afford it, but what they would love to have is a little bit more money in their budget that they're free to spend the way they want to. That is why we're doing this. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We're the money has to come from somewhere, so we're the money has to come from somewhere, and we're, 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 we're prioritising I am going to, prioritizing spending. I am going to put this question now straight across to Graham Winter, if I may. Hey, right, well, I think it's, it's fairly proven that uh, a, a healthy diet aids education. Uh, I don't think a seven pence breakfast is going to help much. Um, <laughs> Often uh, there is a stigma attached to uh, handing over your ticket to say you've got a free school meal. Uh, and 
the worst thing of all is, is children getting bullied for any reason at all, and, and they don't like doing that, because there are cases where that happens. Uh, so Labour will introduce free, free, for key stage one, and we will introduce introducing free school meals. Uh, and, it, and it is, and that's something that helps families. It's not just helping the kids in school, it's helping the families, it's taking pressure off all the parents back home. They know the kids have had at least one decent meal that day. Uh, it's taking pressure off the, the food banks perhaps because the, when they know they're getting some food. Uh, it's, it's desperate that we have to be there, but it, 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 it needs to be a right for everybody. Uh, and I just think over the whole thing it, it, it does help a lot. I know George says if they're putting money in, there are various statistics about you can see them in the internet, they're putting four billion in, but People are confused whether that's on top of the three billion cuts. So, uh, you know, head, head teachers that he says are happy about it are, are writing to parents saying, we've got, you know, 50, 60, 100,000 pound cuts coming to our schools. We want you as parents to, to question the candidates, find out what the parties are doing. So, you know, I'm glad you raised it. Uh, you know, talk to, if you've got kids in school, talk to your head teachers because they're fully aware of the cuts that are coming through. Uh, so, so just very quickly, Nicole, uh, just, 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 just to add the stress that teachers are under and the pressure they're under, and many are, many are leaving the profession, uh, could be enabled by them being rewarded more fairly and ending the pay cap on public sector pay. Is, is uh, I, can't, I can't add much more to uh, Brian's point of view. Um, free school meals is a must. Um, there are too many families who are, frankly, too poor to provide the sort of meal that even the school can provide. Uh, so the sooner we all get our heads around that, the better. Um, uh, so, so, uh, I've got, got lost a bit of the other parts of the question, but um, I've given my thoughts on, on what needs to be done <coughs> for our schools. Uh, we're promising the investment that it needs as far as the teachers are concerned, uh, we're proposing to lift the pay cap. Um, so th th there is so much that can be done um, to, you know, to, to, to benefit the schools, to benefit our young folk. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Jeff Garbett, finally, on this one. Well, I grew up in the glory days of the welfare state, and I had a third of a pint of milk every morning, which was absolutely <laughs> wonderful. But who got rid of that? Snatcher. Milk snatcher. Yes, indeed. It's still there. It is still there. Well, there is still free milk. Well, I'm glad to hear that, George. You, you, in other words, you countermanded Mrs. Thatcher. That must have been a difficult job. But listen. One of the things that, I mean, I, I thought the questioner was, was, was wonderful there, talking about making a level playing field. As a teacher myself, it is a wonderful, noble profession, and I do get quite upset when I see what's being done to it now, the way the teachers are being harassed um, with, uh, with these um, results, payment by results and so on. But one of the things that the Green Party strongly believe in is the best way to, uh, to ensure children have a, a very good start for education is to have preschool. They should starting from the age of about three or four and then compulsory education starting at seven. And I think that would be an important way of uh, making sure that all our children have, much, have an excellent chance of reaching their full potential. Thank you. Um, the uh, Madrid Town Council um, are, have been particularly forward-looking down the years and have um, a youth council, which I think is a particularly good way to involve the young people um, in our town. So I'd now like to extend the last question to a member of the youth council, please. Um, as a youth council, we are passionate about having a say. Would you fight to lower the vote age? In Scotland, of course, um, in the referendums, the, uh, which are run by the Scottish Parliament, the, the voting age is 16. Um, in the rest of the United Kingdom, it's, it's 18. Um, so, is there room to reduce the voting age? Uh, Graham Winter? Absolutely, yes. Uh, there is room to do it. Uh, 
I, I, the only hesitation is I wonder if they teach more politics in schools as well. But uh, in, in, in fact, I think they need to teach uh, politics to the wider community as well as just the school. <laughs> Examples can set a good example to our older folks that don't get involved in politics. So, uh, yes, I'd absolutely encourage it, and the Labour Party will move towards uh, making the 16 voting age a reality. Jeff Williams. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as far as I can remember, our party has been um, committed to votes at 16. Interestingly enough, I had an email from a young lady um, who is. Uh, I think just, just un under the voting age. And her dad has lent her uh, his vote. In other words, he will vote the way she would like to have voted. Uh, I thought that was uh, actually very encouraging. Uh, and I sent her a copy of my of our party's manifesto. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff Williams. Of course, this against the background that a record number of people um, in, in and about this constituency have registered to vote in the forthcoming election. Um, uh, people have been coming out from under the woodwork, I understand, to vote. Uh, Jeff Garbutt, uh, the voting age. Um, I'm interested to hear what, uh, what Jeff Williams said. <coughs> I have the same letter, Jeff, and I've sent her two or three <laughs> <laughs> emails and attachments. And uh, she replied to all my emails as well, so it would be interesting. We will never find out which way she went, but uh, anyway. Um, but certainly, official Green Party policy has been for many years, votes for 16. And the other thing I would want to point out as well to our young representatives down here is the unbelievably silly electoral system we have at the moment, first past the post. <laughs> shocking one, the, uh, the UKIP had something like three and a half million votes in the 2015 election and elected one MP. The Scottish National Party had 1.4 million votes, that's less than half, and they had 56 MPs. It's a nonsense, it's just a nonsense, and we need proportional representation, so I hope the young people will carry that through. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, Party manifesto is heading in, in a particular direction here. Uh, George Eustace. Well, we've all had the same, uh, the same emails. So there's, a of, <laughs> there's a lot of competition going on. For, I think it's Muriel Ellis, she's, uh, she's, she's called for, for her. But look, on, on the issue, this is a... Future Prime Minister, perhaps. <laughs> this is a difficult one. I've got to confess, I've been on a bit of a, a journey on this one, because um, my instinct is you've got to draw a line somewhere. And for most things, whether it's uh, now smoking or alcohol or anything else uh, in life, things are starting to move to 18. So there used to be lots of things were 16 or 17, some things were 21. Mm -hmm. And generally there's been a consistency around the, the, the idea that you become an adult at 18 and that is where you should uh, set, set the line. And therefore, I think for that consistency, um, where we have the current voting age at 18 is probably right. And my view is that we should probably focus on getting more people to engage in politics uh, at 18, young people, because uh, it's great news that we've got record numbers that have registered. As, as Mike said, I've heard that there's a, there's a big surge. The referendum last year actually got lots of new people to register who've never voted uh, in their life, and that's really positive to get that uh, engagement. But I say I've been on a journey, and the reason is this. Um, I often get uh, young people, 16, 15, 16 year olds, uh, who come and want to do work experience, who are really passionate about politics, really interested in it, really engaged in it. And I think there's a bit of a case that says they're engaged in it at that age, and then once they become 18, 19, there's lots of other things going on in their life, and perhaps they miss that opportunity to have an early engagement with politics that they might then stick with. And I think you guys at the front are doing a fantastic job uh, on the Ridge uh, Youth Council, and I filled out one of your questionnaires, I think, at uh, Murdoch Day last year, uh, when you were doing questionnaires on, on the town, and, and that's great. And that's why I say I'm, I'm less certain on this than I was. Our party's position is we should leave it at 18. Um, but for that reason, um, I, I've warmed to the idea of 16 uh, on the basis that I think you might get engagement uh, in a way that we don't. So I'm sure we can all agree that these young folks are the future. You know, we've had our time, haven't we? So, uh, <laughs> um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That's 22 questions answered. Well, 
that at all, really. Um, doing it the other way around now, I'm going to invite a final summing up, a minute if possible, from, um, first of all, uh, Graham Winter. Okay, thank you. Um, well, just to sum up, uh, we have some choices. Um, George has talked about choices. Government makes choices. Governments all have, have to make choices. There's only so much money to go around. The choice is, how do you want that money spent? Uh, you know, are we going to expect another five years of what we've had over the last seven years? Is it time that we invested in our, our people, in our education? Is it our future? Is it time that we invested in our public sector workers who have seen uh, below inflation pay rises for the last seven years and expecting them for the next three? Uh, is it time to invest in our health service and social care, which we all know is broken? Uh, the, the choice is down to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jeff Williams. Well, you've got a choice next Thursday, of course. And I hope that you will choose to vote for a candidate, whoever you decide on, who stands for UK and for a Cornwall that is open and tolerant and as united as we can be under the great cloud of Brexit that hangs over us all. Whatever happens with the Brexit negotiations, and let's face it, it does hang over everything at the moment, we have to ensure that the deal that Cornwall gets is the best that can be obtained, whether we're talking farming, fisheries, enterprise, business. We have to ensure that somehow we've touched on the issue of global warming, that we can still stand together with other European countries against this great American bloc now, which is refusing to acknowledge global warming that united we can stand with Europe to fight issues like global warming and climate, irrespective of what happens with Brexit, that hope that we can still work together with our European neighbours on issues like uh, international criminality, and hope that we can give our children the life chances that most of us have had, to live within a Europe that has been at peace with itself for 70 years, that has allowed us to travel as freely as we wanted to, to live as freely as we wanted to, and to work as freely as we wanted to, and which has allowed us to join together with other countries to combat the big issues that are facing us. Please bear all these factors in mind next week. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Jeff Garbutt, please. Um, I would uh, completely back up what Jeff's just said regarding Brexit. That's something, as I said, which is quite close to my heart. But there's something else which is close to my heart, which is a bit of a touchy subject, which is related to first past the post, and that's tactical voting. Uh, the, the Green Party in 2015 in Campbell and Redruth got nearly 3,000 votes. I'm sure this time it's going to be nowhere near that. We're certainly going to lose our deposit, I think, the way things are going, because everybody is tactically voting. Um, the problem there is that, you know, we're a political party. That's, the Green Party has to fight elections. And if we, if we <coughs> don't, the advantage of, for people at this election to vote for the Green Party is it shows their support for green issues, for the environment, for social justice, all these kind of points which, which and in particular, our unique selling point is the non-renewal of non renewal of the Trident uh, nuclear weapons program. These kind of things are, are very important to the Green Party and by voting for them, you are supporting these policies. UKIP has managed to bring about a gigantic change in British politics, an enormous change in British politics with only ever winning one seat once um, in, in Westminster. So even though you're not necessarily going to win the election, Votes for a particular party, it certainly worked in UKIP's case, demonstrate a support for their policies. So please, perhaps, you know, you obviously if you choose to vote tactically, that's your business. Actually, I had a big conversation with Chris over there on, the F on Facebook a few hours ago about this. Um, but, but please vote for what you believe in. Thanks. Thank you.
And uh, George Eustace, please. Well, Mike, can I just first of all finish by uh, thanking you uh, and Casper uh, and everybody else who's been involved in organising this. I think it's really important in elections that we have these kinds of public events and engage with people. I think we've had a really wide range of um, discussions tonight. So thank you. I wanted to say, I know that a lot of the other candidates here have been saying we need to spend money on this and spend money on that and reverse this cut and that cut. We always have to bear in mind that there is no such thing as a magic money tree. And you do have to fund things. Please, please. Please. You have to, you have to be able to fund things. And, it, and everything has to be paid for. And it is important that we balance the books. That's why we've been able to turn around the message and get Please. But look, my final um, plea is this. Um, the reason this election was called is that uh, Theresa May, Judge, she needed a proper mandate to be able to go there and do this important Brexit negotiation. We need to, uh, this is the Please. biggest decision and the most important decision this country has taken for half a century. I don't want to throw the baby out of the bathwater. I want us to get the Brexit negotiations right, to get the right type of partnership in place. And to do that, I think you need Theresa May and a strong team to lead those negotiations. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I would like to thank um, the uh, four uh, candidates for Parliament, who I contacted by email following a suggestion by uh, Casper a few weeks ago. Um, and I'd like to thank Graham Winter on behalf of the Labour Party. I'd like to thank Jeff Williams uh, on behalf of the Liberal Democrat Party. I'd like to thank uh, Jeff Garbutt from the Green Party. I'd like to thank George Eustace from the Conservative Party. Finally, um, I would particularly like to thank the Reverend Casper Bush, whose idea this was. I guess it's um, not since 1880 as so much noise probably occurred in this building. But um, <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for coming along tonight, ladies and gentlemen. We had two hours, we put a record number of questions in, and I've spoken to those who've chaired uh, hustings elsewhere, and we've exceeded the number of questions um, put at those hustings. Um, Casper has a, a short announcement to make. It, it, it's really odd uh, being in the place of all this heckling. We're not used to heckling in Germany. You want to come at 9.30 on a Sunday? I've got to see you in the Do you want to see your services, Casper? Yeah. I had a couple of two shameless slides before I thank uh, my particular. Um, two weeks tomorrow, my birthday, is the beginning of St Andrew's Arts Festival. Um, it's, there's a week that you can pick up these brochures on the back, all sorts of things, most of them are free, some a fantastic a variety of things uh, on, on the theme of celebrating um, our environment. So uh, do uh, pick up on those and come along during that week to uh, anything that takes your fancy there. And one other thing, politics or not, food banks are a reality. One of the distribution centres is here on a, on a Monday. And uh, there is, because um, you don't expect to come to church and not expect to put down. Put some money in the There pot. is a, a collection <laughs> made which is for food bank. That, that is money that goes to help uh, buy provisions when other donations are, are drop, uh, dropped off for other reasons. So uh, anything you can give to that would be very grateful to receive. And, uh, <coughs> and I wanted to uh, finish by as well as thanking the candidates. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Done all the My pleasure. My pleasure. I'm, um, I'm told this entire um, um, question and answer panel will be uh, viewable on YouTube. Um, and um, I don't know how, exactly how you access that, but um, one of our town's business people has kindly given up his time tonight to come here and film it for us. So I'd like to thank Rob Harrison for doing just that. Rob will explain how you can view the session this evening. Hello. Um, Hello. Yes, uh, youtube.com slash Rob with hair. Easy to remember. <laughs> Rob with hair. So go, go on to YouTube and just put in Rob with hair. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, safe journeys home.